bonjour. Au nom du CRM, je vous souhaite tous les bienvenus euh, à la première conférence de la chaire Eisenstadt euh, de Stéphane Jaffard. La chaire Eisenstadt permet d'accueillir dans chaque programme thématique des mathématiciens et des mathématiciennes des grands renommés pour un séjour au CRM ou pour, et pour donner une série de conférences. At the request of the donor Andre Eisenstadt, the first lecture in the series uh, is addressed to a large mathematical audience. <laughs> Le titulaire de la chair Eisenstadt du programme thématique en cours, modéliser et simuler les cerveaux, est Stéphane Jaffard, professeur à l'Université Paris-Escrété. Il a présidé la Société mathématique de France et a coordonné les projets des assises des mathématiques qui a culminé avec un grand colloque à l'UNESCO. Stéphane Jaffar has received many recognitions for his research work. He has been a member of the Institut Universitaire de France, a plenary speaker at the Latin American Congress of Mathematics, and received the Jacques-Louis Lyon Prize from the Académie des Sciences. Les travaux de Stéphane Jaffar portent sur l'analyse harmonique théorique et appliquée en particulier les ondes lettres. Avec Ingrid Dobéchy et jean Lange Journet, il a construit une variante des bases d'ondes lettres qui répondait à une conjecture de Kenneth Wilson, prix Nobel de physique. Cette base est aujourd'hui un utile clé de l'algorithme de détection des ondes gravitationnelles. Mm -hmm. More recently, he laid the mathematical foundations of new methods of multifractal analysis and applied these methods to a wide variety of data ranging from heart rate analysis to the authentication of Van Gogh paintings. Stefan has already introduced this topic to students in the summer school harmonic and multifractal analyses held this July at the CRM. Il va nous parler aujourd'hui de la chasse aux chirps. Okay, thank you very much, Galia, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I think we have an echo problem. It's no, fixed. it's fixed. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, thank you. Merci. Um, okay, so thank you again, Galia, for this very nice introduction. It's a it's a great honor and a great pleasure to to give this uh, Eisenstein start lecture this this fall and um i must confess that uh, it, it they have a very special meaning to me because a um, long time ago in, in 1996 um serge serge dubuc and gilles delaurier and uh, jean marquina uh, organized the crm semester in uh, on wavelets which uh, at that time was a very hot new topic And um, Yves Meyer, who had been my uh, adver adver PhD advertiser, uh, gave the Eisenstadt lectures during this uh, this semester. And uh, I did not actually I did not attend them. I, I came to the semester a, a couple of weeks later. But um, uh, afterwards, I um, I read the the little book that Yves Meyer. Uh, did for wrote especially on this uh, on this occasion and uh, this this little book has been um, a source of, of inspiration for me for uh, for a long time and uh, it, it really gave some uh, important seminal ideas uh, on the topic of uh, uh, using wavelet tools to analyze Uh, local regularity of functions and uh, local oscillations of functions. And actually, 
I think that the, the lecture I will give today and the, the other lectures I will give uh, next week are a kind of spin off of this uh, very uh, initial and seminal idea that Eve Mayer uh, started uh, in, in this very place uh, some time ago. Uh, so, actually, I, ch I chose this topic uh, because it has, uh, since this, this work of Eve Mayer, it has, uh, it has motivated a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of developments of. Uh, applied harmonic analysis in the, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And it, it still arises some uh, very interesting mathematical problems that I will uh, talk about more in details uh, next week. And actually, it's, I think it's a nice thread to have a kind of tour of uh, some uh, recent advances in, uh, in harmonic analysis. Um, Okay, so what uh, what is uh, really the, the the subject of the of the talks? Uh, so it's a hunt for chirps, and what is chirps? Well, chirps are uh, don't have a precise mathematical uh, definition. Uh, it covers uh, several kinds of uh, phenomena, uh, which which are met in uh, in, in in real life uh, in real life signals and for which you one wants to detect and to to analyze and uh, to develop some harmonic analysis tools in, in in order to in order to do that so the, we'll start with a few a few pictures uh, so these are these are examples of chirps in, in some way so the kind of standard standard examples in uh, in the physics literature, the ultrasound emitted by uh, by a bat, the, the the signals that the bat send, especially during the during the night, to be able to to find uh, to find their way. And uh, what you can see is that it's a kind of sinusoidal function, which which is modulated by a kind of smooth envelope. Uh, just by looking, it's 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 hard to it's hard to see how the, the frequency is evolving. Actually, the frequency is is evolving during the signal, and we will see tools to which which can put that into light. Uh, so the second uh, the second example on the top uh, top right uh, picture is a picture of a gravitational wave. So it's a kind of also emblematic, uh, typical chirp. Which has attracted a lot of uh, uh, a lot of attention because of the big challenges that are behind the, the detection of uh, that were and still are behind the detection of gravitational waves. So this is not exactly this is not what is recorded, but it's uh, it's a it's a mathematical solution of of the, of the equations behind the the fusions of two of two black holes, which provoke a gravitational wave, and this is actually. So the, the particular case that was um, uh, that that fits the, the the data of the first the first detection of a gravitational wave. Um, so here again, you you you, are, you have this idea of a sinusoidal function, the amplitude of which it, it and and the frequency of which it slowly evolving with with, with time in some sense. This is the, the, the next one on the, 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 two, the two bottom ones are mathematical function. One is uh, the, what is called Riemann's non-differentiable function. So it's, um, it's a trigonometric series, which was uh, proposed by Riemann as, as a possible example of a continuous nowhere differentiable function at, at, uh, at the end of the 19th century when, when uh, mathematicians were not we are not sure that such uh, such function existed, and uh, actually it was proved later to be differentiable at some point. This is a you see the function, and here a zoom at a point of differentiability. But the interesting point is that at, at this point of differentiability, you you can see uh, a behavior which is kind of similar what is what's happening here. You have very very sharp oscillations which are getting actually sharper and sharper as you get towards the uh, the point of differentiability and in the last uh, in the last example you you don't see anything but uh, i will come back also ne next week to, to this example it's a sample pass of a levy process so levy processes are an important example of um, 
uh, of stochastic processors. There are Markov processors. There are processors with independent stationary increments. And uh, on a sample pass, you, do, you, you, you don't see anything. But there are some partial results saying that similar behaviors do happen uh, on such sample paths. And uh, a key issue is to, uh, is to find out a, a, a way to, to find the, the, the location where such behavior happen. And this, this, is, this is important also for applications because Levy processors are used in, in a lot of, uh, lot of modeling right now. OK, so these are just to give you a kind of fuzzy picture of what chirps are and uh, the, the, the type of uh, data where you, where you want to, to, to put them in evidence. So be, because of the uh, importance of the, of the detection of gravitational waves and also of the beautiful mathematics, which are behind, behind that example, we will spend today some, some time on, uh, on this, this particular chirp. And uh, what are the harmonic analysis tools which, which are involved in, in its uh, detection? Uh, so a first loose definition is basically what I said. You have a kind of sinusoidal, uh, sinusoidal function with, with a frequency that is uh, uh, with the term inside the cosine, which is not, not linear, but can, can change with time. And you have, this is modulated by a kind of smooth, uh, smoothly evolving function. This is a, a first, I would say, not, not precise definition, but which basically covers the, the two first examples. Um, and we we'll see that it doesn't really cover this one. If you look, well, it's, it's not very clear here, but you can look at the, the, the uh, it, it's really not a sinusoidal function here, but a, a kind of rough function, uh, which, which is uh, happening. And so this third example will show us that you have to extend a little bit the, the definition. Okay, so just to, give you some, uh, some more information about the uh, uh, curves behind gravitational waves. Um, first, uh, maybe the, 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 uh, a few words about the first, uh, the first detection of a gravitational wave, which took place in uh, 2015. And uh, so the, there was a big, uh, the, uh, very, very, very impressive um, uh, experimental uh, device in two, uh, two regions of the uh, of the U.S. Uh, with 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 very long arms, and, and the the idea of the of the experiment was uh, was to have some uh, interference um, be, between two two laser beams. So maybe just to 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 give you a kind of very rough idea of what's what's going on. Gravitational waves are generated by uh, the, so, so the, the first typical example was, was the fusion of two, two black holes. And they, they were actually um, uh, um, guessed to, to, to exist by, uh, by Einstein when he, when he created the general relativity. And the, the loose idea is that in, in general relativity, uh, a, a big mass uh, is, is uh, deforming the, the, the space time. So if you have two, uh, two black holes which, which, are, uh, which are getting uh, closer together and finally, finally merging, they, they turn around each other faster and faster as they get closer and closer. And since they are extremely heavy, it makes the space-time kind of uh, uh, vibrate, and this is this vibration which then then is is uh, is propagated uh, at the speed of light and uh, and can be uh, can be recorded later. Okay, and so the the the, the importance is is basically uh, of two 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 levels. First, it's a confirmation of, of general relativity in some extreme conditions of, uh, of mass and energy, which was, uh, which was not available before that. 
And also, uh, the other important is that it, it has new astronomy. I mean, uh, astronomy before that was um, uh, relied just on, on, on what, what, what we see, I mean, on uh, electromagnetic um, waves, and it gives a new, a, a new way to, to do astronomy. And uh, okay, so ju just to give you a few order of magnitude, and this will explain what are really the, the challenges involved. So the, it's a mixture of two extremes of what, what happened at, at the moment of the, of the merger for this, this particular first gravitational wave that was, that was detected. Uh, the, the, um, the fusion took place 1.4 million years ago. And it was uh, the fusion of two very, very big, um, big stars. I mean, one was the, the mass of 36 times the sun and the other one uh, 29 times the sun. And to, to, to give you some order of magnitude of what was involved, at the moment of the fusion, so in less in one fifth of the second, the, 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 the energy involved was three solar masses. So basically you have the, like three times the sun that was just by, by the equation E equal MC2 was instantaneously transformed into energy. So that was a kind of absolutely huge, um, uh, huge event. And so that, and it was, I mean, so, so important that the uh, gravitational wave, which has, which has at the very beginning, this, uh, I mean, this, this incredible energy uh, still existed after 1.4 million years ago and could be, uh, couldn't be captured. But when it was captured, I mean, it was a techno uh, huge technical, technological challenge because the, um, uh, the, the size of the, the size of the gravitational waves was 10 to the minus 21 meters. And to, to give you some, some idea of what it means, I mean, the, the, the radius of the hydrogen atom is 10 to the minus 11, and the radius of the at atomic nucleus of the atom is 10 to the minus 15. So it's 10 to the minus six times the radius of the atomic nucleus. So it's, it's, it's so small, that actually, for instance, when, when, when Einstein um, uh, imagined the existence of gravitational waves, he saw that they would never, they, they would never be, they could not be uh, spotted because they were really too small. And the, the big problem, which, which is interesting for, for, us, for mathematician, is that it's a, very, very tiny signal inside a huge noise. I mean, the, the, the signal, which is recorded by the, the big device I showed, is of the order of magnitude of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So you, the, the, the signal is 1,000 of, of, of the noise. So you have to find a signal inside a big noise, which is 1,000 times bigger. That, and that's really a, a, a very difficult denoising problem. And, and to, to, to do this denoising, you, you have to, to forge mathematical tools which are really adapted to this, uh, to this particular detection. OK, so the, 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 the idea which was really um, uh, developed by Renner Weiss, who got the Nobel Prize for that a few, just the, the year after the, the detection, is as I said before to to make two two laser beams uh, interfere, and the idea is that you you uh, you make them perfectly interfere when there is no gravitational wave, so that the, the sum of the uh, you have uh, one the, the the one laser beam which is created here, you have a semi-reflective mirror here. And so part of the laser beam goes here and is reflected, and part of the laser beam does that, and then they are added up here. So when, when nothing's happened, you, 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 you just make the device so that the interference makes them exactly vanish. And if a gravitational wave is, is, is passing, basically its, um, its consequence is its 
as I said, it, it makes the, um, uh, the, the, the time space vibrate. So it makes every, every distance get uh, uh, smaller and bigger for, for, for a small time. In, a, uh, in a, and you have this, this little oscillation. So the two laser beams will be slightly defaced and you, you, will, have, you will have a signal. The, the sum won't be zero anymore, but you will have a, a little signal, which, which will be the, um, the signature of the gravitational wave. Okay, so this is what, what, was, uh, what was recorded at the two, um, uh, the two devices in uh, Anford and Livingston. As you see, the order of magnitude is 10 to the minus 18. And as I said, it's basically noise. Okay, and so the, the, the first treatment is a standard Fourier denoising. So if you look at the Fourier spectrum of the data, so basically you, you perform a Fourier transform of this kind of signals. And basically what you, what you see is essentially noise. And you have this, uh, this kind of peaks because you have kind of vibrations that come from, uh, from many different uh, uh, sources. For instance, since it's, it's in the US, you have the, the 60 Hertz peak, which is um, the electricity, the, the, the frequency of the of the electricity in the in the US, maybe in Canada too. I don't know. Too. Yes, okay. In France it's different. Uh, okay, so in France the peak would be at another location. Um, okay, and you have all this noise, and the, the first part of the treatment is kind of standard denoising, and the idea is to to kill all these peaks that comes from uh, from different sources, which are most of the noise. So the idea is to is to make a multiplication in the Fourier domain, so that's just a convolution in the real domain by uh, what we call a filter, which is something like that, a kind of smooth function, which which has kind of peaks in the opposite hole, in the opposite sense, it has kind of little holes where, where you have these peaks in order to kill these uh, spurious frequencies. And uh, so after that, you get a, a cleaner signal. So you see now, now, now the order of magnitude is 10 to the minus 21 instead of, uh, so you have something much smaller. And you can kind of already see here uh, that the gravitational wave is there in the two, in the two signals. And uh, so this is, this is uh, the theoretical gravitational wave, which is the closest possible um, to the uh, to the data. Uh, sorry for that. Um, okay, and then the I mean the the, uh, the this is the, and this is the, this is the remaining one. No, it's okay. So you you could say okay, it's it's not once you have done the denoising, it's 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 not very complicated to see that something is happening here and maybe there is a gravitational wave. Actually, you have uh, of course you have uh, you have to do this in an automatic way, and in order to do this efficiently, you have to to find out a kind of clever uh, representation of these kind of functions. So that you can you you can uh, automatically detect detect them, and uh, so this is uh, the the classical way uh, is to 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 do that is is so this is the gravitational wave again. I mean the theoretical gravitational wave corresponding to this particular case. The classical way is to do short short time Fourier transform. So what does that mean? The idea is that you want for this type of data, it looks like a Fourier analysis would be good. You have kind of good, nice frequencies, except that you don't want to, to make a Fourier transform on the whole line. You, you would not be able to, to localize anything. So you want to do a kind of local Fourier analysis. And this is what the short time Fourier transform does, does for you. It was um, invented by Denis Gabor, who was who received the also the Nobel Prize of Physics, not, not, not for that, but for the invention of uh, laser. And the idea, the idea is very simple, actually. You, you start with the data, you localize the data by multiplying by a Gaussian function, which you localize 
uh, where you, you where you want uh, this is there is a little mistake here it should be a f of t here not f of x i'm sorry and and then you 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 perform a Fourier a Fourier analysis of this local signal okay so you get a two variable function x is the location where you have set your Gaussian function and xi is uh, is a frequency and you can reconstruct the data from this short tight Fourier transform okay so if you uh, a good image is is to think of a, a music partition if you have notes uh, and uh, for instance, if you hear the, the piece of music which is played by this note, you, 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 you would like to, 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 this is the problem basically of musical di dictation, you know, you hear the music and you want to say what are the notes, and this is exactly what the short time Fourier transform is, is doing for you. It's telling you that at this particular location, there is a frequency at uh, the, this, this type of frequency. And uh, so this is typically what for, for this piece of music, this is what, what, what gives the, the short time for your transform. So this is the time basically, and, and you have the frequency here. And uh, so you can more or less uh, see that this, the big, um, uh, the, the big values of the short time for your transform uh, correspond to this, uh, to these nodes. Okay, so if we do that, for uh, this uh, for for this gravitational wave, and this is on the clean signal. This is what 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 can be done using the the short time Fourier transform. You get something where where there is noise, you get basically nothing. And where you see the gravitational wave, you have this kind of of characteristic shape on the short time Fourier transform, which which is characteristic of this type of uh, of this type of signal. Uh, okay, so you have uh, basically you can follow. You have you have frequencies that go higher. So the frequency here gets higher up up to the point where there is a merger between the two gravitational waves, and and uh, then afterwards there, there is nothing anymore. Uh, okay, and these are uh, three of the mathematician and and signal processor will really worked out the, the theory of this, this this theory of understanding the uh, short time Fourier transform of uh, gravitational waves and, uh, and similar object Bruno Torrezani, Patrick Flandrin and Eric Chasson Martin was actually a, a former student of Patrick Flandrin and, and he was the guy in, in, in charge of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, the signal processing tools when when the, this first detection uh, occurred okay so um this is this is good to understand but it's numerically very costly because you basically you you store a function of one variable by the function of two variables and this is not good if you want to do for instance instantaneous detection which is now the which is now the goal because you want to, uh, for instance, if you spot uh, gravitational waves, you would like to be very quickly to tell the telescopes to point in that direction and see and look if they see something. So there is a, a big challenge in the numerical efficiency of, of the detection. And this kind of continuous transforms are not good for that. And so you would like to, to have a discrete uh, discrete transform. So the, the the first naive idea is to say, okay, let, let's replace the short time Fourier transform by some, by just something discrete. And the, the most simple thing is to say, okay, I'll I'll, I'll cut time into um, slots of exactly the same uh, the same weights, and then on each slot I will do a Fourier analysis. And this is actually, this is not bad. It's, it's an orthonormal basis of L2 of R, uh, which, which performs a kind of local Fourier analysis, except that it's not good because it's not, it's not continuous function. You have the characteristic function, which, which makes it not continuous. And that means that if you go in the Fourier domain, you have something which is very badly localized. And actually it, it won't, it won't be efficient in terms of, of detecting local um, uh, local frequencies. 
Okay, so the, the idea that uh, Denis Gabor had was to say, well, maybe we can smooth that. And instead of having the characteristic function of an interval, we can replace it by a nice Gaussian function. So it be Gaussians because uh, physicists like Gaussian functions. Well, mathematicians also like Gaussians, but uh, physicists very much. Um, and you wonder if you could, if you get, well, it, it's very easy to see that you ca cannot get, uh, that this way you don't get an orthonormal uh, uh, basis, but maybe you get a, a Ries basis, which essentially means not orthonormal, but still you can expand in a, in a function in a, in a robust way. And um, these, these, these kinds of hopes, I mean, even if you replace the function phi by, some other maybe more clever functions were killed in um, beginning of the 90s by a famous theorem, the Balliolo theorem, which tells you that if you uh, if you if you consider a system of this uh, of this kind obtained by translations in space and, and translations in the Fourier domain of of one given function j necessarily. The, the function j has, does not have a, a good good properties in term in terms either of space localization or of uh, of, of Fourier localization. So these, these are the, uh, uh, the, the 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 requirements. And so basically, this hope of Gabor is somehow killed. You 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 cannot do uh, you cannot have anything like that. Um, and well, maybe you could you you could say, okay, I'm a little bit too too ambitious to have just one function j. Maybe by using a few of them, uh, I could solve the problem. And uh, so there was another uh, theorem, uh, much harder theorem, which killed all the hopes of this of in in this direction. I mean, if you have different functions, but with kind of uniform uh, localization in space and time, still you can you cannot have a, neither an orthonormal basis nor even a, a risk basis. So it's a kind of strong uncertainty principle for basis. And okay, so Jean Bourguin showed that the, the stupid example I showed in a few minutes ago was, was uh, can be slightly improved and constructed a basis which just shows that Tim Steger's um, example is uh, is optimal, but still is very far from from meeting what you what you really want in terms of localization for um, uh, for applications in in signal processing. Okay, so so the one big challenge was. Uh, uh, how can you turn around this, this Balliol Law theorem and still have something uh, in particular, an orthonormal basis would be uh, would be very good that that does this, this, that does the job that is that does uh, local time frequency analysis in an efficient way. And there was a, the, the first idea was was um, uh, was proposed by uh, Ken Wilson. Who was also a Nobel Prize in, in physics for uh, renormalization theory, and, and he needed a kind of uh, basis with that property uh, to do some some computations in uh, renormalization theory. And um, is is very simple but very clever idea was that for for many applications and that what he had in mind, but also in in signal processing, you don't really need. Uh, a good localization in space and frequency. You need a good localization in space, but in frequency, since you are not dealing with complex exponentials, but with sines and cosines, actually you can have a double localization on, around two opposite frequencies. So the idea is that, uh, let me come back, uh, come back here. Uh, for instance, here you could replace the exponentials by sines and cosines. So that could mean two opposite frequencies, and that would be as good for signal processing and other application. And the the the, the, the remarkable uh, point was that once you have dropped that, and we, we now call that this Wilson basis, then you you the the Balian law theorem does not apply any longer, and you can have very good uh, very good orthonormal basis. 
which are basically of the, of the previous form. So you, 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 you shift, a, you have just one function phi, you shift it, you multiply it by cosines and sines in a, in a clever way, and you get an orthonormal basis. And the function phi can be, uh, you, you, are, you have several possibilities. So for instance, what, what was needed for Wilson's computation was uh, uh, an exponential decay in space and in the Fourier domain, and you have examples of that. And so this is the construction I, I, uh, I did with Ingrid de Bushes and, and Jean Lajournet. And uh, you can also, uh, another example which did not attract our attention was that you can also have the function phi, which is compactly supported in the Fourier domain and which has a fast, uh, fast decay in, in, the, in the space domain. Uh, okay, so these are... Uh, photographs of uh, Jean Lajournet and, uh, and Ingrid Dobuchis. And so these are the two, the two important examples. And actually this, this basis was a little bit used in, um, uh, in quantum mechanics, but not so much. And the, um, the, the, the nice point was that it, it was um, Sergei Klimenko, who, who, who was working on this, on this problem of detection of gravitational waves, just realized that it was uh, exactly the, the tool that he needed to do, this, um, uh, to, to do this detection of gravitational waves. And, uh, and he, he picked the case where, where, where the function phi is compactly supported in the Fourier domain, which was exactly what he uh, uh, what was needed, and so this is uh, this is the, the picture for for this first gravitational wave of the uh, short time short time Fourier transform, but discrete using this system. So it's not as nice as the picture I showed, but it I mean it's uh, uh, you, you you get it much 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 faster, and, and you recognize this kind of typical sh shape of the chirp here. Which, uh, which is the signature of the, of the gravitational waves. And so um, the, why did Sergei Klimenko pick this particular basis? Because, and, and, and this, this, this came at the top of, of, of many works of, uh, in particular of the people I mentioned, Bruno Torrezani, Patrick Flandrin, and other people. Is, they, they have the remarkable property that you have a sparse representation of gravitational waves on this basis. And by sparse, I mean that you, you can represent it using very, very few coefficients. So basically, if you have a big noise, if you have a basis on which you don't have a sparse representation, you, you won't see the coefficient of the function because they, they will be drawn in the noise. And if you have a a sparse representation, you will have a few, your, the, the signal you, are, you, you want to detect will have a few big coefficients and they will be larger than the noise because of this sparsity. So the, 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 the idea of sparsity of the representation is really the key idea here and it makes the detection, uh, the detection possible. Okay, so let me uh, come back to other, uh, other types of, of chirps. So I, I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the ultrasound emitted by, by a bat. And I said that it's okay, it, it's not so clear to see here what's, what's happening exactly. And this is the, uh, so here I, sh I show you the, the, the classical short time, short time Fourier transform so that you can see the evolution of the frequency of the, what we call the instantaneous frequency as a function of time, which here is going slowly down and this is the, uh, the this is the the signal uh, emitted by the bat when it approaches um, uh, the, the the prey and when it's it's getting it's attacking the prey you have a different a different ultrasound with a different signature in in the time frequency uh, domain okay so these are uh, I think, so this, this is, uh, okay, I didn't explain exactly. Uh, so this, this, this is the, the amplitude of the short time Fourier transform. So it's basically essentially vanishing, except on this uh, particular line, which give, which give you the evolution of the instantaneous uh, frequency of the, of the signal. 
So to, to model this type, this type of chirps, uh, we can keep the definition I, I gave at the very beginning and be a little bit more precise. If, if you want this kind of analysis using short time for a transform to be efficient, you have to assume uh, a few hypotheses, basically two, two hypotheses, which are kind of standard in, um, for this type of data. The first one expresses the fact that uh, basically if you go from uh, one oscillation to, to the next one, the, the, the amplitude the amplitude of the uh, of the envelope does not change much. This is what is explained by the what is um, mathematically uh, expressed by the first condition. And the second condition expresses the fact that the frequency, the local frequency, does not change much from one um, uh, from one um, uh, oscillation to the next one. Okay, so if you have these two conditions, you will have um, these kinds of chirps, which uh, uh, for which typically a time frequency analysis will be will be fitted. Okay, and this is a very good approximation of this gravitational wave. Um, not not up to the merger point. You see that this uh, it, it should go to infinity, which is not the case. But close close to the merger point, it's a good uh, it's a good approximation. And you see that it's basically it looks like uh, it looks like that. Okay, so this is a first kind of of chart for which you can make time frequency uh, an efficient time frequency analysis. And now I would like to to go to another types of chirps, uh, which have been analyzed and uh, actually much, uh, much considered by Yves Meyer and a little bit in, in, in the book I was mentioning at the beginning and then, and then later he, come, he, he came back to it, uh, which are of another kind. And so I come back to this Riemann function, first because it's a, it's a nice historical uh, example uh, which, which has attracted the, the, the interest of many mathematicians, but also because recently uh, there, there has been a very surprising connection between this function, which has been found, and turbulence, uh, turbulence data. And uh, among physicists, especially physicists who do uh, turbulence modeling, uh, the, um, the idea that you have kind of very fast oscillations in, in turbulence data that seem to occur at some point, in particular around the uh, um, uh, uh, vorticity filaments uh, was well kind of heuristically acknowledged, and one one big challenge is when you have recordings of, of turbulence data, can you can you find out this kind of chirp behaviors? And uh, actually, so this this was not experimental. This is a theoretical. I mean. Um, uh, in a series of uh, a series of papers, several mathematicians have, have proved that for a realistic model of turbulence, the the, the evolution of um, the corners of uh, what we call vortex filaments. So that's the kind of uh, uh, filament around which the the, the, the turbulence is, is turning evolved with exactly with this uh, Riemann function and in particular uh, show uh, shows uh, the typical chirps and this is a kind of uh, evolution of one point of this uh, vortex filament in the in the plane it's 2d turbulence so it's taking place in the plane uh, so so this was the first theoretical evidence that this kind of chirps like behaviors are, are occurring and uh, in in turbulence and it revived the the interest for numerical methods that would be able to to find this uh, this type this type of chirps so let me show you again this this Riemann function this is the picture i showed already and this is where you zoom here uh, around the point as I mentioned, the point of uh, of differentiability, and as I said, you have this this very of, this very oscillatory behavior, but 
you, you can, um, this is a joint work I did a long time ago with Yves Meyer. You can, you can write a, an asymptotic expansion of the Riemann function around that point. So basically you have a linear path and then you have a chirp behavior, something like uh, a sine one over X, except that it's not a sine. It's uh, the first term is another function, which is essentially a Riemann's function. Not exactly, but you, you have to subtract um, uh, a smooth function, but it's essentially a Riemann's function. So it's not smooth. And as I said at the beginning, it, it does not fit this um, framework of A of T cosine uh, phi of T with this nice and smooth uh, A and T, because you see that the function you have to put here is, is a non-smooth function. It's basically, it's Riemann's function it's itself, which shows up in the, um, in the oscillations. Uh, so it does not fit the previous framework, but you, you still want to call that a chirp also. And um, you want to be able, as I said, to, to analyze uh, so, such data and to, to spot them in, uh, in signals. Um, so this is the question I'm, uh, I'm raising. And one way to, uh, one way to do it is um, uh, to, um, to consider the pointwise regularity exponent. So what, what is the, the local regularity, the regularity at a point of the function you are, you are considering? So I'm just recalling here the definition of the classical definition of pointwise older regularity. The function is C alpha to point if F minus its Taylor expansion can be bounded by X minus X naught to the alpha. And the older exponent, which is a way to measure the, the regularity at every point of the function, is just the, basically the best possible alpha you can, you can pick here. Okay. And uh, so typical examples of function with a given older exponent are the, what we call cusp, x minus x not to the h, and the, uh, at x not, the, uh, the exponent will be, uh, the older exponent will be h exactly. Okay. And uh, so can you see the difference between cusp and other very oscillating behaviors like Riemann's function that I was showing? And the answer is uh, the answer is yes, uh, and you can do it as fully as follows: uh, uh, a, a, a cusp singularity has a, has a nice property that if you take a primitive of the cusp, you will have of course x minus x a constant x minus x naught to the h plus one. So basically, the for this type of singularities. When you take a primitive, the uh, the regularity is raised by one, which, which basically is what you would expect for when you take a primitive. Except that when you have oscillating singularities, like what's happening in Riemann's function, so I'm taking one a little bit uh, simpler, uh, like that. And if you uh, and here the the older exponent also, I mean the sign is bounded by one, so the older exponent is also h exactly. But if you take if you take a primitive, so I'll uh, I'll, I'll leave you the you, you you can ask your uh, first year university students may make the computation. It's just integration by part, and you can see that if if you uh, if you take a primitive of this function, the other exponent is not raised by one but by beta plus one. Okay, so it's because of these very fast oscillations when you. You, when you integrate, you have cancellation and, and you have a larger than expected improvement of the, of the pointwise regularity. Okay, and, and you, you want to take advantage of this difference between these kind of chirps. So you, you could do the, I mean, the, the, the sign doesn't play a particular role. You can do the same computation with Freeman's function. What you want to, what you really need here is a, periodic function which, uh, with a vanishing integral, and that, uh, that would be as good. And you want to take advantage of this difference between cusp singularities and oscillating singularities to be able to, to, to see the, to spot numerically the, um, the difference. 
Okay, and um, how can one take advantage of this difference between the two, uh, the two, uh, uh, the two behaviors uh, under um, uh, uh, taking a primitive? And this is given by a wavelet characterization of pointwise regularity. So that means that you you have, you have to change the tool of analysis. We, before we were doing some. Uh, in particular, when we were using Wilson basis, where we were doing time frequency analysis, we were localizing the signal and then doing Fourier analysis. And wavelet analysis is based on another paradigm, which is time scale analysis. So you have, at this time, you have one particular wavelet and you take translations and dyadic dilations of, of the wavelet. So you get a system which looks a little bit like that. And so this is the, the classical theory of orthonormal wavelet basis. You can, you, you, you can pick smooth, smooth uh, function psi, smooth well-localized function psi, and get orthonormal basis. Uh, and to, to, to show you the big difference between Wilson basis and wavelet basis, so here are examples of Wilson basis, so you see you, you don't have the same, the same shape. You have, the, in the Wilson case, you have a characteristic, uh, characteristic length, and then you make faster and faster oscillations. So you, you don't have the same shape, but you, the, the, the system on which you analyze your data has a characteristic length and um, different frequencies. And here, it's, it's really different. You always have the same shape, which is shifted and, and dilated. So it's really two different point of view, time frequency versus time scale analysis. And time scale is, is, is a good way to characterize pointwise regularity. Uh, OK, so these are just a, a few of the, uh, this is a photograph of a few of the major actors of uh, uh, construction of wavelets, Yves Meyer and uh, Stefan Mala and uh, Ingrid Dobushis. Uh, this, this picture was taken during the celebrations for Yves Meyer's uh, Abel Prize. And uh, okay, so this characterization is, is done not directly on the wavelet coefficient, but on another quantity, which is which we call wavelet leaders. So the idea is to parametrize the wavelet coefficients by uh, dyadic intervals, which basically tells you uh, where is the support of the wavelet. And the idea is to, to consider new quantities, which are wavelet leaders, which are local suprema of wavelet coefficients. So you, if you think of this, this is, uh, for instance, a dyadic interval parametrizing a wavelet. And you take the supremum of the wavelet coefficients corresponding to these wavelet coefficients and the next ones and the ones basically located at the same location, but at higher and higher frequencies. And you look at this suprema. And what you can show is that if, if you have some uniform uh, regularity uh, on the data, you, you can exactly recover the pointwise order exponent by a pointwise log log regression of these wavelet leaders as, as a function of the scale. So two to the minus j is basically the width of the wavelet. Uh, okay, so so this is this is just a, a numerical uh, explanation of, of what's happening. We have a, a beautiful cusp, and basically this, this these are some scaling invariants. You see, it's x minus x naught to the h. So since wavelets have also scaling invariants, they deduce from each other by translations and change of scale, it's very natural that when you look at the wavelet coefficients located at, at the singularity, you, 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 get, a, you, you get a nice log-log uh, pot regression, and the slope is exactly the exponent. And if you do wavelet leaders, you get, you get the same thing. But here, you have a function which, which does not have any more uh, scaling invariance. If you if you shift and dilate it, you, you don't get the same function, and this is reflected by, by the fact that if you look at the wavelet coefficients located uh, at the singularity, you 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 don't get a, a clear slope. 
But the magic of the, of the previous theorem is that if you look at this wavelet leaders, though you don't have scaling invariance on the function, you have scaling invariance which is restored by the wavelet leaders. And if you do log log pot regression, you get basically the, the right exponent. Okay, so this is what you can take advantage of if you use wavelet leaders. And um, okay, so. Uh, I don't have time to go too much into that, but I just wanted to point out the, 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 the two tools, Wilson bases and time frequency methods for some kind of chirps, uh, wavelet bases for uh, other types of chirps. And actually, what I, one of the points I will, uh, will develop in the next week is how you can take advantage of these different behaviors under integration of cusp and shirts to, to work out tools which, which allow you to, to say if there, if, if there are chirps in, in the data and what, what kind of chirps you have on the data in the data you, you analyze. Um, so just to sum up things, uh, there are, for this last type application of chirps, there are some uh, several uh, theoretical applications. Like, as I said, I, I took the example of the, of the Riemann series, but there are also um, random wavelet series, uh, which is a st standard um, uh, model of a stochastic process for which you have also th this kind of chirp, which you can prove uh, to, to show up. And, uh, and the point I, I started, uh, the example I gave in, in the first example of my, uh, in, in the first slides was, sample path of Levy processors. And this is really important because there is a, an important work of Paul Balanza a few years ago who, who proved that there are some chirps in, in the sample path of, of Levy processors. But uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't have the, the, the whole answer to, 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 to the question. He proved the existence of chirps for some Levy processors, of non-existence non for some others. Uh, but we, we, we don't have the full picture. We don't know exactly what's happening. And it's really important because the V processors are, um, uh, are models in many, many, many applications. And um, so this is, again, what I will talk a little bit about uh, next week, taking advantage of, of the fact that when you have chirps like I showed in the Riemann function, you have, you have this very specific behavior of the pointwise regularity, which depends on a parameter beta, which characterizes, uh, which is a signature of the chirp, and you can take advantage of that to, uh, to spot them. So just to, to give you the next challenges, I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, on the detection of chirps in turbulence data with uh, Patrice Abri and um, Francois Argoul. Uh, we are starting to talk about brain data with uh, Jean-Marc. Uh, and um, uh, also uh, an important issue in uh, seismic recordings. Uh, there are some, some clues that from, uh, uh, there are chirps in seismic recording which, which could be a, a warning of uh, uh, important events. And uh, so detecting also chirps in seismic recording is, is, is a big issue. And I'm starting to work on that with uh, Martin De Hoop. And uh, on the theoretical side, I, maybe my talk will give you the impression that there are two split methods between time frequency methods and Wilson bases and uh, time scale method and uh, uh, weighted bases, but it's, probably not the end of the story. And uh, a, a big issue in um, harmonic analysis now is, is, is to make the two approaches merge and to have a kind of um, super decomposition, which would be time scale frequency, mix the two approaches. And that, that, that would allow to, to give a complete um, um, more full description of what's happening um, and uh, to detect chirps that are neither of each kind, but kind of mixture of both. 
And actually, there are, there are some, some precise clues that this is what is needed. For instance, I, I cheated a little bit, and in the detection of gravitational waves, it's not just one Wilson basis which is used, but a collection of um, uh, two to the of eight Wilson bases which are dilated from each other. Uh, be, because the chirp doesn't have a uh, characteristic scale, and so you need a kind of time scale frequency analysis, and it's this this, this kind of ideas which is already in, in, implemented in the in the detection algorithm of of, of uh, gravitational waves. So it's these of these ideas are these, these ideas are are starting to be uh, to be worked out. And I think it's, it's really the, the next big issue in the, um, in the domain. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, my understanding, like the, the, the church that uh, you've been presenting this talk were mostly one dimensional, right? Like, uh, apart from the turbulence example. Yes. I was wondering how does the 2D or 3D church look like? Um, <laughs> okay, I, I, I have a joke about 2D chirp, which is uh, the next slide. It's Great. a picture I took with uh, Jean-Marc during the, the school we had uh, la, la, last July. It's a selfie I took with the, this device, and I think uh, it, it gives you some idea of what a 2D chirp <laughs> could be. <laughs> now, this, this is not a serious answer. Um, it, uh, Okay, I, it's hard to yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, turbulence, in the case of turbulence, the the, the 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 nice sharp data on which we have many scales to do analysis are really one D scale. It's they are uh, uh, they are um, uh, data recorded from um, turbulence created in wind tunnels, for instance, and you you look at the at the at the speed of the of turbulence um, as a function of time at one point because this is what you can compute very accurately uh, so basically in in, um, in the case of turbulence uh, yeah in most cases we have one day examples if you want now the, the mathematical frameworks work, work in several dimensions for instance the, the world rate characterization you can use several dimensional wavelets to 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 define chirps and so on, but to say exactly what they look like, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any good example. Okay. Yes. You started with the last nose uh, wave. With you started uh, your talk with the uh, last uh, nose wave. Yes. And uh, on, uh, on your talk is related to this. Yes. Uh, I didn't understand what is the relation between this and the two direction laser waves. Ah, okay. Um, uh, maybe I should come back to the yeah yeah to the slide. Yeah, I went a little bit fast on uh, uh, on that. Uh, yes. Okay. So you 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 have a laser beam starting from here, okay, which is split into two. You have a, a semi-reflective mirror. No, no. You have you have one one laser beam here. Okay. So just one. It's split in two direction, and you. Uh, you the, the device is so that you have a precise frequency of your laser beam so that when they come back and they, they, they come back and they uh, uh, this one is reflected and this one crosses the, the mirror so that they, they recombine here okay and if there is no gravitational wave the lengths are are set so that they are exactly in opposition of phase you see and then the sum is just zero. Okay, so when nothing happens, you, you, you don't have any signal here. The signal is zero. Now, if you have a gravitational wave, it, it, it makes the space time vibrate. So it makes the lens, for instance, if, if it's going this way, it makes the, the length here shrink. And when, uh, 
when the gravitational waves crosses this room, we all all of us get uh, bigger and smaller in a in a in, in an infinitesimal way. But you see, so the so the uh, the, the perfect reconstruction to zero of the two laser beams is no more perfect because you have this this slight contraction and dilation of space which happens and 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 the sum is no more zero and it's it's the signal i showed a constrict uh, laser uh, very with high frequency originally uh, these, these two uh, two one uh, region you uh, reflect uh, this uh, all together yes uh, and uh, to, the result is a uh, wave with uh, high frequency more more frequency. yeah 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 it's high frequency uh, yes i agree yeah but, uh, it's not possible at the uh, first time you have such more frequency wave uh i yeah i'm not sure i see, I see what you mean I'm not a specialist of this. I mean, I, I kind of give you the idea, but uh, <laughs> I'm not a physicist on that. understand the relation between this and the bus. Uh, yeah, uh, so the relation is that at, at the end, you get this, this specific shape uh, with, which reflects uh, the, the, the contraction and dilation of space time. Which we, which is just what, what happened at the, at the very beginning. I mean, the, the 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 shape of the gravitational wave. The important point is that the shape of the gravitational wave that was created at the beginning during the merger of these two uh, of these two uh, black holes is is absolutely preserved. I mean, it it it, it crossed the, the universe for billions of years, but it's just the same. It it just because it it, it it's evolving. It's uh, Getting wider and wider, it, it's getting smaller and smaller. But it's just the initial, uh, just the same uh, shape as. I mean, th there is no interference with with uh, objects in space when when it, when it travels. So you get exactly the same space that was the same shape that was there at the beginning, and so it it tells you exactly what happened at the at, at the very beginning. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, we will leave uh, um, the rest of the questions that uh, maybe uh, we can speak with uh, Professor Jafar at the reception, which will be held um, in the Salon Monsabé, which is right behind us. So you're all welcome to attend. And next week, uh, Professor Jafar will give uh, three more lectures on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. in the fifth floor room, which is uh, right underneath. Uh, so let's uh, thank you again for a wonderful talk. Thank you.